I come in here both as your bishop, but actually also someone from the outside. And a part of what that means is, I actually have no idea what's going on in your life. My life. You don't know. Or many times we don't know what's going on in each other's lives. And yet, the challenge for the preacher is to say something that actually has meaning to the people who are in the room. How is that going to happen? If he doesn't know, there's only one way that can happen. Is that if somehow God breaks through the words that I have prepared, the words he may inspire me to say in such a way as that you in the pew go, oh, mm, that's for me. And that's what I want us to pray for. Would you pray with me about that? Because the only God can do that. All right? Then let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you have promised that when we gather together in the name of your Son, that you are here. And we thank you so much for that. That you invite us into your presence, that you welcome us. And that because of the forgiveness of what you have won for us in your death and resurrection, we are welcomed into your presence. So we pray, O oh Lord, that not only would you draw us near to you, but that you would open up our hearts and our minds to you in such a way as that we might receive what you are saying and that you would make room in us for what it is that you desire to impart. And so we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We yield to you. And we thank you that you are here. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As you know, we are confirming quite a few people this morning, and a couple of them have prepared a little brief testimony about what all of this means to them, and I would like to call them up. So the first person, Travis Pruitt. Where are you, Travis? There you are. If you will go to the lectern and briefly share a little bit of your story and why you're being confirmed. Thank you, Mr. Pruitt. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was born and raised Presbyterian. I was fortunate in that I was very close to my minister growing up as a child. He was a father figure to me, and I loved him as such. He was one of those rare individuals you meet in life who possessed this quiet power, the type of person who could be in a room with a group of strangers and without saying or doing anything, everyone in the room would know the Holy Spirit was in this man. When I was 13, he had me convinced that I would follow in his footsteps. <coughs> Parkinson's robbed him of his strength and his ability to preach, and eventually his life. I started to grow distant from the church. In high school, I took a job at the local grocery store. What's the reward for being in high school and working at the local grocery store? In addition to low pay, you get to work the busiest shifts, right? Saturday nights, Sunday mornings. Now I was attending church only on my days off. And I grew farther from the church. College came, and with it unfortunate habits that sometimes accompany college. Then I wasn't attending church even on my days off. And I grew farther from the church. Marriage, job, child, life moves on without church. I still pray, I still read occasionally, but the physical act of attending church every Sunday, not important. This was about to change when my daughter was six years old. My wife and I were taking my daughter and her friend to the movies one day. My daughter's friend is being raised Roman Catholic. We happened to drive by his church on the way to the movies, and your friend was telling us about his church, and Jesus, and about what he learned in Sunday school. It was then that my daughter mentioned two words I will never forget, two words that would change everything. Who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? A voice in my head, I'm sure it was the Lord, spoke to me and said, 
you've really messed up now, Travis. <laughs> Your daughter is six years old, and not only is she not baptized, she doesn't even know who the Messiah is. Nice job, Travis. That night, I did what any respectable, lax Christian parent would do. I went on Amazon.com and bought one of those kids' Bibles, right? <laughs> She'll know Jesus, and I still don't have to go to church. Win-win. <laughs> but it wasn't. Not even close. Ironically, it was my wife who called me out. She told me, if you're going to raise our daughter Christian, it's got to be all or nothing. You can't just drop her off and pick her up an hour later. You have to go with her. You have to lead by example. And she was right. Like so many of the important things in my life, she was right. By God's grace, I found the Episcopal faith in this church. I'm happy to say my daughter is baptized and goes to Sunday school. With Father Reed and Father Al's help, I'm standing here before you today. What does confirmation mean to me? It means that after 23 years, church and faith are once again important in my life. And I will never take that for granted. Thank you. Thank you. My lovely friend Isabel has a little stage fright, so I volunteer to read her speech for her. <laughs> in confirmation class, I have learned what it means to be an Episcopalian. First of all, even though we are Episcopalian, we're still Catholic. In the Episcopalian church, we just do things slightly differently. For instance, there are parts in the Roman Catholic service where they do the sign of the cross. In the Episcopalian church, you can either do it or you can choose not to. Either way, it is correct. There are three lights, if you will, in the Episcopalian church. Holy Scripture, Reason, and Church Tradition. I became a Christian since I was a child. I was fortunate enough to be born to two wonderful, married Christian people. They baptized me when I was a baby and chose Godparents for me that remained a major part of my life. As I've grown up, I remain in my faith with the guidance of my parents, Godparents, family members, and wonderful friends. I will continue to be the Christian that the Lord calls me to be. To me, Confirmation is the way I take responsibility for my own faith. When we were baptized, our faith was our parents' responsibility. With confirmation, I believe it is my way of taking my faith into my own hands. I am stating in front of God, the bishop, my priests, and the entire congregation that I believe in the Bible, Jesus, and God, and that I will live my life in accordance with their teachings. This is my way of taking my life and commitment to my Lord and Savior into my own hands. Thank you. When these people come forward for confirmation, I'll be asking them questions found in the prayer book. And the answer is, in fact, the answer almost always is, I will, what? Do you remember? With God's help. It's that with God's help part that is so foundationally important, not just to the Christian life, but actually also to the things that we read about this morning and even the prayer. The colic, did you hear it? Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. If, you, if that is an ice water on your face, I'm not sure what is. Because that's not, you know, my, our tendency can be, oh God, it's really not that bad. Except for this stuff over here that I don't want to talk about and hope nobody else notices. You know, that's, that's the kind of game that we play often with God, where we think we're really doing pretty well all right, but then there's other things that we just sort of act isn't there. A part of what the scriptures do, as well as the prayer book, is that it forces us. Sometimes, what's the old cliche? I was dragged kicking and screaming, kind of like Travis's story where God breaks through, not just in, as it were, the nice parts, or not just in those parts where, oh, I know I need a little help, but actually in those places, whether they be a profound hurt, whether they be of conscious rebellion, whether they be of serious addiction, 
whether they be a kind of alternate life I don't want what anybody else to know about. You, the gamut is there. The good news is, is that God knows all of who we are, and he wants to speak to all parts of who we are, not just the sort of nice stuff that we show up and present within the context of a local church service, like this one. So that, you know, how are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. How are you? Meanwhile, something else is going on way down in the subterranean part of who I am, and that's the last thing I want to talk about. The whole point of what we're saying here, though, is that we don't have to pretend with God. In fact, He wants to be the kind of Savior for us that no matter how rotten it might be, He's not afraid of it. He knows how to meet its challenge. He knows how to be profoundly realistic, both about the state of the condition, as well as about the depths of his power. That's what Paul is trying to say in the Romans lesson. I mean, did you hear this? Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Okay, that's we're talking about non-Christians. But, in verse 10, the Spirit of Christ is in you. Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, yeah, we have deadly, awful, wicked things that we have to wrestle with. That's what Paul is meaning metaphorically when he's talking about the body of sin. He's not just, he's not talking about human flesh marred as it is by the fall of creation. He is talking about that whole part of who we are that doesn't want to live under the authority of the Spirit of God at all, much as we wish that wasn't the case. And all of us have it, don't we? Nod your head. I mean, before this tribunal, we're all standing before the God before God on equal territory. Some of us might be nicer than others, but quite frankly, we all have things that we have to wrestle with. And because that's the case, but yet, what has God given us? The scripture goes on in Romans. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Oh, now that's something else altogether, isn't it? I mean, that's what we see illustrated in the raising of Lazarus from the dead. See, Jesus knows what's going to happen. He's paying a high price for it. He is weeping. There's a part of him that is in profound anguish, both because of the effect of death and the grief that it causes, the way it so undercuts the very possibilities and promises of life. But also he knows that this is, in fact, this raising of Lazarus is going to be the trigger that sends the Pharisees and the chief priests scurrying to hatch the plot that will eventually result in his crucifixion. The Spirit of God comes, but there is a high price. But Jesus is unafraid of the cost. He is moving toward the tomb. And he says, roll away the stone. It's an incredibly dramatic moment. And of course, what does his friend say? Oh, it's been four days. He's all decomposed. If we open up the tomb, it smells. Or as it says kind of uh, casually in the King James Version, master he stinketh, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> but does, do you think that deters Jesus? Not a bit. You see, he, he's not afraid at all of any part of our life that stinketh. In fact, there's actually a phrase for it in AA. It's called stinking thinking, where we, in essence, lie to ourselves about the worst parts of who we are and a level of denial that tries to keep it in a distance, even though it may be doing its very best to try to take control of us. And it is in the face of sure death, four days' worth of decomposition, it is in the face of knowing that the price of this miracle is going to be his own crucifixion. It is in knowing, however, that the one whom he loves dearly, his friend, is captive at this point to all that death could do to him. It is in the face of all of that that Jesus raises his voice, Rick exclamated it, thank you, with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Somebody said, 
You know, if he hadn't used the word Lazarus, there would have been dead people coming out of the ground all over Israel. <laughs> That's the nature of his power. That's the nature of his passion. That is the nature of his compassion. All three of which are important. That is the nature of his power. In other words, there is nothing in me or in you that rebels against the spirit of Jesus and wins. As much as the rebellion is in us, Jesus can quell it. Jesus, as it is promised in Romans, will bring all of who we are, life, to our mortal bodies. And notice that he says that. In other words, what he's not just talking about is the resurrection of the last day. But he will give life to our mortal bodies, meaning that the presence of Jesus in this flesh, right now, in this life, will break in and make a remarkable difference that will be noticed. In other words, it's not just that somehow you're kind of living life and you don't know whether you're a Christian or not. That's not the spirit of Jesus. Maybe something else, but it's not the spirit of Jesus. Man, when the spirit of Jesus is resident in you, that kind of power and that kind of life, it ignites you. It ignites you. And it changes you. So that his power becomes your passion. You love him. You love him. There's a reason when Jesus stood on the shores of the resurrection with Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? Because you see, that above all is the sign of the presence of God in our hearts that we desire more than anything, even in the midst of the places where we struggle, to walk in a relationship with him that will not let us go. And it is his power that breaks in and puts that kind of presence and love within our hearts. But it is also his passion because he passionately pursues us. Do you know that you are the object of God's passion? That when God thinks of you, he's not sort of, you know, drinking iced tea on the heavenly throne trying to figure out what you're going to do next. No, 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 no. He is the one who is actually involved in the circumstances of this life, drawing you to himself. You are the object of his passion. He pursues you. And you are also the object of his compassion. Because he knows, as the scripture says, he knows whereof we are made. He knows all of who we are. All the things that we know and the things that we wish we didn't know and the things that, as my wife tells me all the time, that we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> because, you see, I actually, as much as I work at self-examination, I know the fact that there is a part of me that I don't even know is there. I don't have the capacity, you see, to stand outside of myself and look at myself as an object. That's the limitation of the humanist command to know thyself. I can only do that so far. I need, you see, the Spirit of God to come and to reveal not only himself to me, but who I am in his presence. And he does so in great compassion. Not to wag his finger and say, why didn't you get that right, you jerk? That's... The Holy Spirit doesn't talk that way. No, 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 no. He, even in revealing to me the places where I'm in such profound need of forgiveness and of healing and of God's mercy, reveals those to me precisely because He loves me so that the very healing presence of Christ can come deeply into those places where there is only darkness and condemnation. So no matter what you think in your life is stinking, He's not afraid. He pursues you. Why? Because he loves you. And he understands that only the presence of the Spirit of God can come in and bring order into your life. Because, you see, who are we without him in these stories? 
Where the dead bones of Ezekiel scattered in the desert? Where Lazarus locked away in the tomb? But the good news in all of those stories is that Jesus comes and sets Lazarus free. God commands Ezekiel to come and prophesy to the bones, and they stand up, as it says, an exceedingly great host. God is speaking to you and saying, don't give up on the dark parts of your life. He cares about you passionately, profoundly. He is pursuing you so that you can come into a place of wholeness and grace and mercy, of real freedom, so that what you know is the very presence and power of the Holy Spirit, the very same Spirit which raised Jesus from the dead, dwelling in your life and literally changing you from the inside. See, I don't know what you're going through this morning, but I know this, that literally no matter what it is, no matter what it is, God cares about what you're going through. Profound, compassionate, Personally, and it is his deepest desire to bring all of who you are into his presence, not for reprimand and condemnation, but for his healing and wondrous light. You see, he knows, St. Augustine put it this way, we have to have the Spirit of God to be able to love him and obey his commandments. And it's the case, and he knows that. So that we can come and lay who we are before Him, even all the things that we don't like, and say, Holy Spirit, unless you can come and bring life into this, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's not going to be good. Please break in. And I am utterly confident that He will do that. Whether sovereignly or sending someone in Ezekiel your way, who knows how to move by the Spirit of God and bring life, to those parts of your body that are dead. That is the good news of the gospel. That no matter what's in your life, it doesn't have to be hopeless. But that instead, because God is such a wondrous realist, and because he knows all of who we are, we can be all of who we are in his presence and give all of who we are to him for his forgiveness, for his healing, his mercy. Let us pray again. Gracious Lord, I thank you that there is no part of our lives, not one bit, that you don't deeply love, even the things that we may hate, even the things that we wish were not there. And it is your desire to take those places in us, to cleanse, to heal, to restore. So Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to take those places out of their dark, dark, secretive closets within us. And that you would open up, us up in new ways to your light. That we might know in new ways your grace, your mercy, your peace, your joy, your resurrection power in us. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to step down here, but I'm going to keep talking. Here's what's going to happen. You see what they're doing? They're going to bring a chair out here. We're going to get ready for confirmation. But what I want to do is just tell you briefly what this, what's happening in terms of what this means. This dear group of people have said, in essence, the very things that I preach, okay, God, I'm willing to take you up on that commitment. I'm willing to be faithful 